Could you see the guitar down a little bit in the monitor, please, James? Appreciate it. Thank you. worship you, Lord. That's what we're doing. You tell us what to do, God. Child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch keeping this this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and the angels sing haste haste to bring him lot the babe the son of Mary why lies he in such mean a state where rocks and sinners hear the silent word is pleasing this this is Christ the king whom shepherds guard and angels sing haste haste to bring in love the babe the son of Mary nails nails fear shall pierce Cross me, Lord, for me, for you. 
sends gold and myrrh, compares in king to own him. The king of kings, salvation brings, let loving hearts enthrone him. This, this is Christ the king, whom shepherds guard with angels sing. have uh, ask you to have your way in this sermon just have uh, words to give to Dan and Mary's heart would be for you Lord yes. in the name of Jesus amen. amen by faith we ask that in the mighty name of Jesus amen, amen. hallelujah you may be seated if you like we're gonna take up tithes and offering you know it's, you can never out give God amen sometimes we don't think we got enough to give God we got more than enough to give God we give in faith and obedience to the Word of God. You know, it's the cool thing about tithes is it, 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 it goes to your account in heaven. Amen? It goes to your account in heaven. Here you go, brother. I don't know. This thing is loud. I don't know if the, mon if the monitor can go down any or what, but... Woo! Praise be to Jesus. I'm going to pray over the offering right now. Lord, I pray a blessing on every giver. Lord, I, I know that we give in faith and obedience to the word of God. And Lord, wherever our faith is stretched or weak or we're in doubt, Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to trust you in the word of God. In the mighty name of Jesus. And we give to you, Father. And we ask you to apply it to our account. And that you, Father, would use it on this street corner to declare the gospel to those that come in. In the mighty name of our God. Amen. Hallelujah. How's everybody doing? Good to see you. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Christmas time, great time of the season, isn't it? Oh, man. I'd like to encourage you. I'm going to read, I believe, from the book of James. That's what's on the outline. Chapter 2. I'd like to encourage you in your faith, though. I want you to know that this is the time right now that as this year ends, what are we going into next year? Anybody know? 2024, amen? So what happens on January 1st, 2024? It's a brand new year, amen? Is there anything that you've gone through this year that you wish that that year would just get over and be done with? Anybody got that on your agenda? Can you raise your hand to that? Is anybody looking for a new year, hoping there's something better that lay ahead? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, not to put a damper on our faith or our hope, but, you know, there is a war going on in Israel right now. You know, you, anybody see that war going on in Israel? Anybody been praying for that war going on in Israel? Pray, pray, pray for Israel. Amen. Man, how lucky are we that we can walk down the street and there's not bombs coming over over our head, you know? Kids, three-year-old, five-year-old, going through these bombs and wars on their street. I mean, and you know, it, it might be bombs and wars, but you know, it's a spiritual war. And there's a spiritual war going on there, just like there's a spiritual war going on here. And some people believe that the reason America has not been judged yet is because America has been faithful to Israel all these years. But I hate to say it, but our government isn't so for Israel anymore like they were before. And we don't really know what lay ahead. But this is what we do know, that we know that our God, he's faithful. He's the almighty God. He's the creator of all things. And this is something I believe I'm learning this week. I mean, I've said it many times, and I do believe it. But now I'm starting to really believe it. God is in charge of everything. Amen. God is in charge of everything. 
Think about how much peace we could have if we realized that God is in charge of everything. Think of all the tur- troubles and the toils and the battles that we end up fighting because we don't have faith that God is in charge of everything. I mean, it's a war of the enemy. You believe that? It's the, it's the attack of the enemy against God's people. And if we're God's people, I hate to say, but we got a, you know, a bullseye on our back, got a bullseye on our forehead, got a bullseye on our chest. There's a real go- war going on right now in America And it's not a physical war, it's a spiritual war, amen? And if you're here right now, or if you're in faith right now, and God is calling you to the church, to the body of Christ, then you can trust God with your faith, amen? But there is a scripture that says, seek him while he may be found. Because trials can come, and then all of a sudden we forget to seek him. Or even blessing can come, and we forget to seek him. And if it doesn't take much to be at the... the, at the um, pigsty. At the pigsty. What happened to the guy at the pigsty? Was he a bad guy necessarily? No, he got sidetracked. He got sidetracked. And he didn't guard the thing that he had that was the most. It's faith, amen? And we're going to read here in the book of James where he talks about faith. And the first thing he says in chapter 1, or chapter 2, verse 1, this is what he says. Because we read this and we're going to read a couple things. And I don't really think it's about what it says it's about. I think it's really about this first sentence. It says, my brethren, do not hold, it says, the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. What does it mean to hold it with partiality? Well, let's read this scripture real quick. Now, this gives a definition of it, and this is a true scripture, and this is a truth, and it tells us specifically to do this or not do this, or behave, that follow the scripture. But let's read it. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should come also in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and you say to him, Oh, you come sit here in this good place, amen? And say to the poor man, You stand there, or you sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves? And this is what we do when we become partial we become judges with evil thoughts amen see because that person what he did was he became partial with his faith and he became partial with his understanding and he looked at the outward appearance and he said you must be better than this one so let me give you the honor seat amen but i don't really think that's the most important part of the scripture because because you could do you you don't even see that happen around here do you there's a blank So sometimes you might feel justified in that scripture when you read that scripture because you don't do that specific thing. But what if you reversed it and you said, oh, you good one, because I'm mad at you. You're rich one. And I put you in the seat of the worst seat and you poor one. I put you at the top. Would it be doing the exact same thing, but in reverse order? They're both wrong. That's the point. And that's the point. He's saying, don't take the scriptures and do it because you can look at the one and say, well, I don't do that, therefore I'm justified because I sure don't do that. There's another scripture in the Bible that we read many times, and I think that we get the point of that one wrong. Remember the, the, the scripture of the rich young ruler? What did the rich young ruler do? He came to God. What did he do, Paul, you know? Yes, yes, and he stood there. He told him all these good things that he did. And he goes, but what else must I be? What else must I do? And what was the answer? Give away all of your stuff. And it said he went away sad. See, we might find ourselves in that same scripture and go, well, I must be justified in that because why? I'm not rich. But I don't think that's the point of the message, because whether we're rich or poor, It's the same command to give away all that you have and follow him. And it's the same kind of thing that's happening. And he's saying, don't be partial in your faith. And being partial or partiality in your faith is going to a situation and an understanding that you have and then judge it one way or the other. Well, this guy doesn't need money, so I'm not going to give him money. But you judge it wrong. Does that make sense? So he's trying to bring us to not the point about whether we put the guy in the right seat or not. He does want us to do that. Why does he want us to do that? 
Well, that's a great point. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. The first shall be last and the last. We don't really know. Amen. Because if they come in, what do they both need? They need God. One's just got money. And we could, hey, you, you, you ever frown down your nose? That's what's going around the world right now. People frowning down their nose at people with money. See how the gospel's even getting twisted? See, because it's the law that kills. It's not the law that's important. It's the understanding, and it's the key word is faith. And he says, in your faith, don't show partiality. But we can go to the word of God and it could be a law and we can say, well, I don't do that for therefore I'm justified. But if you flipped it around, you could be just as guilty one way or the other. But what will change that? The relationship with God and not showing part because what we can do is show partiality to scriptures. How many people are in the church? That will hoop and holler to the scripture and stand on for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And they believe that unequivocally. No, right? Well, I believe, therefore, I'm saved. But on the other side of that, he said, but go and do this and go and do this. And there's a whole lot of other scriptures besides just that one. That's showing partiality to the word of God. Because you can't take the one and disregard the other. And you can't take the other and disregard the first one. You always have to take them all together. And the key ingredient to the whole partiality thing is intimacy and relationship with the father through what the word of god but one other thing the holy spirit yes and that brings grace amen so let's read on because he does it right here let's read on verse three i think i already read that one verse five listen he says this well let's look at number four because it says when we show partiality with the scriptures No, it, no, yeah, but it's saying, anyway. He's saying when we do show partiality, well, I'll read the scripture. My wife's looking at me crazy. Have you not shown partiality? So why did they show partiality? What was the fact that they did that made them show partiality? They were, go ahead, Paul. Preds of, yes. What's the last thing we need in the church? Prejudice. Amen. What's the last thing we need with the word of God? Prejudice. Because we could look at one guy and that guy, hey, you could look at the pastor and say, and this is a true thing too, but you could look at the pastor. Well, that pastor doesn't need the word of God. He's got the word of God, but he might be the exact guy that needs the word of God that day from you. Amen. But we might look at it completely different, not say nothing, but the difference would be that when we're walking with God, because this is one thing that God, he doesn't want us to be followers of the law just by following the law. He wants us to walk with him in faith. And in the walking with him in faith, it makes us automatically be followers of the law. Because we could go to the law and say, well, I don't do that, so therefore I'm justified, but then be just as guilty because we're doing another aspect. Does that make sense? So the most important thing is this is what he wants for you and I. He wants to change our nature from our fallen nature to his divine nature. Because the divine nature, what is the divine nature? Anybody, what is the divine nature? Christ-like. Spirit in us, exactly right. Oh, before the fall. And that's really what made Jesus so good because he came here without the nature of the fall. And exactly right. And that's what he's trying to. Hey, so if that's his goal, do you think his goal is so when we get to heaven or do you think his goal is for you and I now today to be in the divine nature? But when we try to just walk forward and fulfill the law of God, have you ever tried to do that and find yourself falling short? Because you're trying to do it in your own strength and you get wore out in your own strength because you're just trying to, I'm just staying on the road and I'm going to stay. And then next thing you know, we're fighting against God. But God, I did that specific thing. So therefore, you got to let me in. You know, the other side of that is son or daughter. I'm already in. I came in the day when you accepted me as Lord and Savior. And I'm in here right now, and I'm trying to fellowship with you. 
and I'm trying to take your fallen nature that is beating you up and wearing you out, and I'm trying to transform it by the renewing of your mind, and I'm trying to replace your fallen nature. You think that's the first thing we want to give up. God, here's my fallen nature. Take that. But you ever notice that when God tries to come and bring his divine nature, you end up socking it up with God and fighting God? Because you're trying to hold on to your old, your old nature. And then he, sometimes you go through a big battle, and then you see the, the working of God, and you go, man, why was I fighting God that whole time? And that's one of the reasons why he says, when we look to the, look at verse 1 again, he says, my brethren, do not hold the faith or your faith that comes from our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, without partiality, with partiality, meaning judge the word of God, amen, and hold a, to the standard, not the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. And there's only one way to get the spirit of the law, through the Holy Spirit of God, amen? Let's read on. Verse 5, he says this, because uh, verse 4 again, because what we don't want to become is judges with evil thoughts. And we become judges with evil thoughts when we hold the law or the faith of our Lord with partiality. Meaning I'm justified here because of this faith, but I don't have to live up to that standard because that I have a reason for that. So I've, ju I've just been partial with the law. Verse 5, he says, listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in his faith and heirs of the kingdom? So what did he call us to be? Rich in faith and heirs of his kingdom. Do you know that's what he's working out in you and my heart right now? Every battle you go through, that's what God's trying to work out in, in your heart, is that you and I could be rich in faith and we could be heirs of his divine nature in our heart. If you have a great day, that's what he's trying to work out. If you have a difficult day, that's what he's trying to work out. Because that in itself is the divine nature that he's trying to work in and out of you according to his good purpose. Amen? But listen, which he promised. It's a promise from God. It's not a promise from God to bless us. It's not, or it is, but not to walk in only in blessing. It's not a promise to be rich. It's not a promise to be popular. It's not a po promise to be great. It's a promise to be blessed. Um, to walk in, I just read it, the promise of God, to walk in the faith in the heir of the kingdom of God, the divine nature, that's the promise of God, that we would have his divine nature. Verse 6, but you, he says, when we've done that, when we become judges with our, with our evil thoughts and we be partial in our judging of the word of God, you have become dishonored, you, but you have dishonored the poor man and do not, the, and then he goes on to explain, do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts, but do they not blaspheme the nobleman by which you are called? Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself here, guys. But you have dishonored the poor man. How did they dishonor the poor man? Amen. If you've done that, have you done that? Oh, I like it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No, I like the confession of faith. Amen. Because that is the most best thing about the word of God. And that's the most best thing about the power of God. Amen. That it comes to speak to our heart and it can reveal to us our need for God. Amen. Because that in itself is how we begin to apprehend the divine nature of God. Come to the end of ourself and say, God, I've tried this and I've tried this and none of it works. But the one thing I know is you are faithful and that you are able and you know how to bring me through from where I'm at to a new, new place. Amen. And he says, verse seven, do not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called. What noble name are we called by? The name, the noble name of Jesus. See, I think we've kind of lost sight of that just in America, the Church of America. It's the noble name. It's the name that is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess because it's the noble name. In him and by him, all things were made and through him, right? And for him. And he's given us that name. And he says, J protect that name. Honor that name. That's why he says don't show partiality because in the showing partiality, and I struggle with this all the time, showing partiality dishonors the name. And guess what? You can't in your own self overcome that simple, that simple little thing. 
It's such a simple thing, but what a mighty mountain of battle that is. Because his nature is not our nature. But he gives us the Holy Spirit to both work in us and through us to do according to his good pleasure. And uh, hey, we need that now more than ever in this body. We need it in the church of America. We need it in the church around the world. We need it, hey, I hate to say it, but we need it in the pastors of the, the churches of America and the worship leaders in the church of America around the world, amen? And hey, we're all just like that poor broken guy that comes in and you're coming in. We, we would be considered the poor, right? Even if you had $100,000 a year, I, mean, I think that's considered poor, amen? That really is considered poor, especially in America today. You and me, we're going, boy, that sounds like a good lot of money. <laughs> ah, but we're not poor in the things of God, amen? Amen. Let's read on. Verse 8, if you really, now see, this is the cool thing about this. Let's read it. Verse 8 says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you sh and this is the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. See, now somewhere in the New Testament, now we're not under the law, but for some reason that we're saying we're not under the law, but it is kind of putting us under the law, isn't it? What, how is this putting us under the law? And it's not the law of the Old Testament. It's called the law of liberty, which we read here in a minute. It's the law of liberty. What is the law of liberty? Freedom. How did you become free? And the law of liberty keeps us in freedom. And how does it keep us in freedom? By rebelling against the word of God or obeying the word of God? Obeying the word of God, amen? And the word of God can be obeyed by the power of the Holy Spirit, amen? Let's read on. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well, but if you show partiality, you, you, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law, yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of what? All. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said what? See, we might go, well, I don't commit adultery, so I'm good. But then at the same time, we might have murder in our heart by what? Hating our brother, see? That's why he says, do not show partiality, to, the, or do not hold your faith in partiality, because the, all of it is good, right? It's all the standard that God is getting. It's all beyond our abilities. But the one thing that it isn't, it isn't beyond our ability to allow him to uh, strengthen the divine nature in the depths of our heart. See, that's the battle you're in right now. That's the battle everyone in this room right now is in, whether we recognize it or not. Every battle, everything that we're going, we're, we're battling whether we're going to allow the divine nature of God rear up in us or not. And the promise from him is that huh, he's never going to quit. Why is he never going to quit? He does love us. What else? Why is he never going to quit? It's his promise. And he says, if we remain faithless, what does he remain? He remains faithful. Exactly right. And he's going to re remain faithful to, to himself. So that spirit within us, right, has carte le blanc with God to surrender to God and allow God to, to build the divine nature in us. And it doesn't sound good to us because w what is the divine nature? It's contrary to what? Our fallen nature. It's contrary. I just went through something this week, and it was a, it was a bad experience. But the beautiful thing about it, on the other side of the bad experience, I could look at the one thing that God was trying to do. He was trying to break something in my heart, see? So at the time as I'm going through, even I'm telling myself, don't get upset, don't this, don't that. C keep your mind, just trust God. But I couldn't help. I couldn't sleep for two days, right? I couldn't eat for two days because I was stressed. But then on the other side of it, I go, man, God, I was stressed. But the whole time you were just trying to break something in me. If I could have just learned to trust that you were building the divine nature in me, right? 
That's what the course that we're in right now. You see, the enemy wants to rob us from that. And the enemy's trying to come and rob us of the divine nature. But the divine nature is the way that God is going to minister to you in this time. Let's read on. He goes on to say, verse 12, so speak and so do as those. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by what? The law of liberty. There is a law of liberty. Means you got set free. The law obeying the Holy Spirit will keep you free. Right? And then when you obey the Holy Spirit, guess what's the first thing you obey? The word of God. That's what it always will do. See, if you got something going on in your mind right now and you don't know if it's the voice of God or it's the voice of the enemy, the voice of the innocent, yourself, you go to see what the word of God says and it will tell you whose voice it is. Right? Because God's never going never to come up and tell you, it's all right, lie. Just lie. Just, just be a little bit here. Just do this. See, because you go to the word of God and see the voice of God always lines up with the, the word of God. And he says, so, and what is the Holy Spirit trying to do? God's never going to reject us, so he's always trying to keep us free in the law of liberty, which is freedom, because we've been set free from these things so that we can walk in them. And in the process of walking in with them, slowly but surely, he transforms us by the renewing of our mind, amen? And we become uh, the divine nature here on earth. Verse 13, for judgment, this is the key scripture here too. It says this, this is a good one for me. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. What does that say to you? Anybody? Ah, How do you show mercy? Forgive. Yeah. You ever notice it's easier to forgive somebody when they just made the same mistake that you made, but it's harder to forgive somebody when they're making a mistake you haven't made? See, that's not showing mercy. That's just feeling guilty because you made the same stupid mistake. So you can, but showing mercy is say, I'm just going to choose to forgive you because of what God has done to me. And he says, let's read. That's exactly what it says. That's why he tells us to show mercy because mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen. Because that person that's in judgment, God wants them to experience mercy that, so that they can get free from judgment. Amen. Verse 18, that's why he's called. I believe that's why it says in the scripture, if you don't forgive, you can't be forgiven because we're robbing somebody else of the ability to be forgiven. We're called to be forgivers. We're called to be an avenue for somebody to come to you and say, hey, man, I've done something wrong. Well, let's take it to the father. Amen. But then when we get all where we don't forgive people, and we hold them in judgment. Now we're blocking that person's access to forgiveness. And he says right here for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen. Verse 14, what does it profit it, my brethren? See, how do we know he's talking to us? Because he's calling us his brethren. What makes us his brethren? Children of God and um, members of the body of Christ. Amen. See, God didn't, we're not just here because we showed up. We're here because God is the divine order and he's brought us. Amen. He's God. He's God. Woo! Huh? Hey, I was going to say that in the beginning. That's what I was going to say. You know what I like best about God? That I'm not him. Amen. Ah, he's so great, isn't he? He's so gracious. He's so forgiving. He's so loving. He's so kind. Ah, and the other thing is. He's all powerful. He's all powerful. And we he's in our corner. He's in our corner. He's for us. Huh? He's interceding. God, you you father, you see that knucklehead? I see him too, but help him this. Just help him, right? <laughs> hey, we can trust him. We can trust him with our shortcomings. We can trust him with our circumstances. We can trust him with our money. We can trust him with, believe it or not, you can trust him with your heart. You can trust him with 2023. You can trust him with 2024. 
Verse 14, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he does not have works? And I think the reason this is in here, because he's going to bring up a, uh, Abraham. And what did Abraham do? Think about Abraham. D Abraham walked with God, right? With, that was one of the things I wanted to bring up, too. Thank you, Deb. Without the law. Do you know that all the stuff that God was speaking to Abraham, it was the word of God to Abraham, and it was not written yet? But it was the word of God. How do we know it was the word of God? Because we read what was written so we know it was the word. And God said to Abraham. So it was the word of God to Abraham. See, that's why it's not the law that we hang on. Because we don't need the law specifically by itself. What we need more than anything is ears to hear the voice of God. That's what we need above all. Because when we have ears to hear the voice of God, it's going to automatically make us want to obey the word of God. They're not separate. They're identical. The word in, in is the same as God. I mean, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. There's no separation. So to obey the word of God isn't running around going, boy, i got to know all this and know all this. I encourage you to know all that. But that's not the answer. The answer is knowing the voice of God and then walking with him, right? And Abram was walking with God. Let me ask you, when Abram was walking with God, do you think there was a lot of blessings going on in Abram's life? There, there was a lot of blessings. He was blessed by God. And the journey was long. It wasn't a short journey. It was a long journey. And God brought him here and through all of this stuff, just like he's kind of doing to us. Do you think there was good moments with Abram and God? And then also bad moments with Abram and God? Right? And the whole time he's having a relationship with God and God's preparing him. And he's preparing him and he's showing him how great he is, how, God, how great God is. And he's showing Abraham, I'm with you. You can trust me. You can know me. And let me lead you through this journey. And he's doing all this and he's blessing him and bringing peace to him. And he's looking at his livestock and his family. And he's on this journey and he's in this great moment with God, though it's difficult at times. But then he brings him to all of a sudden he turns this corner. And he says, and now I want you to kill your son. Oh, my goodness. See, because if Abram would have showed partiality to the word of God, he would have said, well, God, I accept all of this stuff. And I'm walking with you in all of this. And this is all good. And I like it. But when he got to this point, he would say, well, I, I can't trust that word. See, that's what we kind of do with the word of God. Well, we trust this scripture. And because this is beneficial, I can do all things. And we trust this scripture. But this one's difficult, and this one's hard, and this one's going to cost me something, and I don't really want to sacrifice it. See, and that's where the divine nature starts to stop. Because when he brings us, it's full of blessing, it's full of this, and it's got joy, and it's got great things. And, well, man, we're all excited about God, but then God brings us to another place. And then he has a way of doing it. It's not about being saved, but I am requiring that from you. I'm requiring you to make this sacrifice. I'm requiring you to change your attitude. I'm requiring you to love somebody. I'm, trying, I'm requiring you to overcome yourself. And we stop. And we start showing the partiality. Well, I can believe this. But now, right now, the rubber's meeting the road. It's getting difficult. And then we just kind of stop. And think about Abram. See, he didn't stop. He kept coming. Think about this. You go, man, tomorrow. Deborah, man, I just went through what I went through over something stupid. Could you imagine laboring all night thinking that tomorrow you're going to kill your son? But at the same time, he was still having faith that God would come through. But at the same time, he's wrestling in his heart. Man, this is so difficult. See, sometimes we get going in our walk of faith, and God's trying to bring us to a new place. And in that new place, we don't trust it. We're scared. It's going to cost us. It's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. And then we just stop. And then our faith is hindered. And then we go, well, it doesn't take all that. To do. I guess I'm just going to stay on this course. And then we can't figure out why we're always stuck in the same place. And we keep turning around because we took the law of God, the faith of God, and we were partial with it. And we hindered applying it to our work because this is what God could never deny himself. And this is one thing he'll never stop doing, requiring more. Remember, he said to the rich man, he goes, I've done all of that. What else should I do? He said, sell it all. 
And it's not just for the rich man. We always go, oh, that, that rich man, he, he wanted money. Wouldn't it be worse if we're the poor man? And the same requirement is to sell all you have, and we go, I ain't doing that. At least he had something to give away that really would cost. We have very little. See, it's not about money. It's about our heart. Because he's trying to get us the divine nature. And the divine nature doesn't come easy. See, if it came easy, everybody would have it. We'd all be running around. Woo! Right? But it doesn't come easy because it's so contrary to our fallen nature. Our fallen nature is protect me. My fallen nature is bless me. My fallen nature is eat. My fallen nature is this and that, entertain myself. But our divine nature is the same as what Jesus had. Lay down your life. El Shaddai, the almighty God. Let's read on. Because this is the work. See, and we're going to read about works right now. I know when we read about money and we read about works. Feathers go up. Hairs. <laughs> money, works. Everybody start building the wall, start digging in. But this is the thing about works. How can we learn to die to ourselves if we don't do the works? And it's not the work. That's important. It's the before the work, the wrestling with God and say, God, I'm going to do it regardless. I'm going to do it because you told me to do it, God. That's where the work, the work, because it says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. All we got to do and walk in. So it's not even us doing the work. The work is in our heart, like Abram had to do with his heart. He had to work over his heart. He had to wrestle, just like Jesus the night before he went to Gethsemane. He was in there, and he was wrestling with his flesh. And his flesh saying, God, if there's any other way. And God said, sorry, son, there's no other way. He says, nevertheless, thy will be done. God, if you could just deliver me. Abram did the same thing. God, wouldn't you just take uh, Isaac? It would be better if we just use Isaac. No, Isaac's not the promise. See, Isaac would violate the word of God. Ishmael, thank you. Yes, thank good to be in the house of the scholars, amen? <laughs> Ishmael, see? Hey, and this is the beautiful thing about Ishmael. Ishmael was part of God's plan too. Because he said they would be uh, fighting against God's people all this time. Guess who we're fighting right now? All over. Hey, and guess what they want to do? They want to chop your head off. And they're sneaking in the borders all the time. And our government, for some reason, took it on their shoulders to start scanning against Christianity and supporting Islam. See, this is the time right now in our heart to be working it out, to say, God, whatever you have in store, I want you to prepare me. If it's going to cost me something, I want to give it to you. If I can't give it to you, would you help my heart change? I would be willing to give you this. See, that's the place right now. Because when somebody's got a sword at your neck, it's a hard time to say, okay, now I believe, or okay, now I'm ready to surrender. It's too late. Because then we'll just say, uh, I don't even believe in Jesus. Please don't kill me. Right now is the time for our faith to be established and, and work it out in our heart to say, God, whatever it is, whatever it is in me that's hindering you, please forgive me and please help me overcome. Amen? So the work isn't, a, sometimes we think it's all these works. I can't serve God because there's so many works. The work isn't to do a bunch of stuff. The work is to work it out in our heart to trust God to lead us to the next step. And it sounds so easy, and we all say it, but actually to apply it is a whole different thing. Amen? Evidence of, yeah, relationship with God. Exactly right. Exactly right, brother. Verse 14, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? See, I don't have to have faith because I believe. That's what we hear a lot. I don't have to do that because I believe. Can faith save him? Verse 15, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. See, they had the opportunity to meet the need to do a work but you do not give him these things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? You or him, really. Verse 17, thus also 
faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. See, Abram had, Abram had to fight in his heart to make his heart willing to go tomorrow and do the exact thing that God had told him to do, whether he liked it or not. And he, got, he became good in the situation to trust God. So then when it came time to do it, it was just working out the works. But he had to work his heart over until it was ready to surrender to God. Amen? But here's, the, let's read on verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. And I will show you my faith by my works. Because like my brother said, the works that we are doing is evidence of us hearing from God. It's evidence of our relationship with God. And the work, we'll never be able to stand up and say, God, look what I did. Because it says he's, it's, we are his workmanship and it's his work. So we can't even do that. But we can do this. God, I wrestle with my heart. See what I did? I surrendered my heart to you. And you know what he's going to say there? He, he, uh, thank you, my child. See, because the devil's trying to come in and the world's trying to come in and deceive our heart into surrender. Where God's trying to lay down his life and love our heart into surrender. Verse 19. Now, see, listen to this. Because people say all the time, well, I don't have to do that. I believe. But what does it say? Verse 19. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the devil believes this. But they tremble. See, we need a trembling faith. If the devil and the demons tremble, and they believe that, and we're not trembling, we might have to wonder, do we really believe? Verse 20. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see the faith that was working together with his works? See, the day before is the work was done the day before. It wasn't done the next day. It was done the night before or the week before or whatever it might have been. And by works, faith is made what? Perfect. So what does the works do? It helps us to crucify our flesh. It helps us to surrender ourselves. It helps us to die to ourselves. And when we do those things, he rises up. And then slowly, his will becomes our will, which is his divine nature, begins to become natural to us. If you could look at your life right now, you'd probably say you do a whole lot more things now for God than you used to do. Or th certain things might be easier to do for God. Why? Because slowly his divine nature is becoming our nature. And if you stay the course, it will change even more. That's why it's so important, because that's what the work is for, is to bring us to a place of, one thing, trusting him, one thing, knowing him. But not only that, when we do the work that God's called us to do, now, you know how much faith we can have in that work actually accomplishing what God sent it out to do? Because I, I, I wrestle in my heart a lot. A lot. Man, did, am I just doing that, or is it God doing it through me? And a lot of times, I'm sure it's just me doing it. And you look at it, and you go, man. But I think God wants to bring us to a place of trusting that it's him working through us. Amen? Let's read on. Verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness see remember this abraham was before jesus well not jesus eternally but jesus on the cross and abraham was before um the law but guess what abram and noah and others what were they found righteous why because they believed god amen and he says and he called and he was called the friend of god he calls us friend you see that men, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Amen. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot who just justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? She was another one. She had to risk her life. She was taking her life in her hands and she didn't even know 
if these guys were really going to do what they were going to say they were going to do. And they, she didn't even know if she would be delivered. But there was something that happened in her, and there was an act of faith. And these guys came, and they, she'd heard the testimony about the great God. That's what she'd heard, the testimony about Jehovah the great God. And they come knocking their door. She probably just wanted to lock the door and keep them out. She was out of fear. But she didn't. She listened to them, and she, she talked to them, and she said, let me help. And they go, if you help us, we'll do this. And, God, and even that act of faith, she didn't know for sure that it would come to pass the way it was, but she did it in faith. See, the, art, the work was being done beforehand, right, in her, in her heart and trusting God. Amen? Verse 26, for as the body, this is, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Amen. I heard this preacher say the other day, he said, not that you can compare them, but you take all the other religions, Muslim and uh, Hindus and Buddha and, and yeah, all of that. And he said at their best scenario that they could ever do with their teachings in their way is they could maybe take a bad man and turn him into a good man. Where Jesus did just the, what Jesus did, he, he came and he took a dead man and made him a live man. Amen. So they can, no matter what they do, all they could do is make something temporal that maybe somebody would be a better person. Which there's nothing wrong with that, that to be a better person. But what Jesus did, he came along and he took some dead people and he made us alive. Amen. Forevermore. Amen. Lord, we thank you, Father, for your grace and your truth. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I know that you're doing something in our midst at Calvary Chapel La Mesa. We're here. Our hearts yearn for you, Father. We need more of you, Lord. Our nation needs you. Our children need you. Our kids need you. The church of God needs you. America needs you, Lord. Our pastors need you. We need you in this room even now, Father. Lord, it's your divine nature that you would have us to have. And so many times we struggle with that, Father, even though we can look back and say, look how God, good God has been. So, Lord, even now by faith, we ask you. We ask you for a miracle in our hearts. See, if you want something from God, you have to ask. See, we could come here and preach a message, and it could be what it is, good, bad, indifferent, ugly, whatever it might be. But we could also come here and hear from God, and God could be speaking right to your heart. It can't be wasted time. If we're here, God had something to say, each and every one of us. Maybe it was to learn to sacrifice. Maybe it was overcome. Maybe it was, who knows, learn to forgive, trust. But we don't want to just come here and have a message and sing a song and then leave. But we do want the, the hand of God to do a miracle in our hearts. So even now, wherever you're at, I would just ask you by faith to do an a inventory of your faith. The Bible says to judge our heart, whether we be in the faith, to judge ourselves. And if we are in the faith and we say, well, God, what are you doing in our faith? Lord, how are you the Lord? Lord, is there something I need to change? Is there something I got to confess Lord, is there something I got to quit doing? Is there somebody I got to quit hanging out with? Is there a house I'm going to I shouldn't? Lord, am I honoring you? Am I honoring your name? Am I honoring what you've done for me? Lord, is there a place for me in the kingdom of God that I could be used? So even now, we're going to sing a song. If you want to just sit where you're at and let a conversation between you and God happen, speak to him, meditate on him, worship him. If you need to make a change, make a change. If you would like prayer, come up. We'll pray with you. We have people of faith that pray. You don't have to confess anything. You want just strength. You want support. You can look to the guy left to you, to the guy right to you, the lady, and say, hey, would you pray with me? Did you know that you
your baby boy has walked where angels trod. When you kiss a baby, you kiss the face of God. Mary, did you know Mary, did you baby boy one day rule the nations did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb the sleeping child you're holding is the grave amen amen hallelujah what a mighty God we serve, amen. Lord, we thank you, Father, for all that you do in our lives. Lord, we just ask you to lead us as we go from this place. Help us to surrender, Lord, and trust you and obey you, Father. Trade our fallen nature for your divine nature, Lord, as only you can do by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. They'll know you are Christians, how? By your love, kindness, gentleness, self-control, mercy, not being judgmental, not being prejudiced, showing partiality by your love. So hopefully every person here, we're growing in our love for Jesus and for one another. Amen? Love one another, Jesus says, as I have loved you. Love one another. Um, so tomorrow night we have our woman's, uh, celebration here at the church at 630. And, um, <clears throat> so we're going to need to change the sanctuary around. So if you don't have a broken back or a broken knee, you know, especially the guys that are here, um, we can change this whole place over. It's going to be beautiful. We can change it all in about 10 minutes with everybody helping out. And so on Friday night is uh, praise and worship night, prayer, praise, and worship. So that's at 6.30 on Friday night. And uh, we've got a great sermon this weekend, 6.30 and uh, Saturday night and Sunday at 10. So it's great to see all of you here tonight. Isn't this amazing on a Wednesday night? Amazing. You know, and don't think that you're not important to the body of Christ. Every person here, we're important to the body, Christ, uh, the body of Christ. And you don't have to be perfect to come to this church. We are broken people. We are hurting people. We, 
we need, I, I love Dan's shirt, hope. There's always hope for every one of us here in this room. There's hope for the prodigal sons. There's hope for the prodigal daughters. There's hope for the people walking in the street. His name is Jesus, King of kings and the Lord of lords. So the food bank will be open. God bless you guys. And those that can help out will start to work and change this place over. Have a great night. God bless. Fun it is to ride in a wondrous open sleigh. Hey, jingle.